हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Oh, I'll just share the screen with everyone here. Yeah. Okay, everyone can see the PowerPoint, yeah? Recording in progress. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Lesson 5, Dharma in the Bhagavad Gita. Lesson 5, Karma Yoga superior to Karma Sanyas. Karma Sanyasa. <coughs> we learn from Bhagavad Gita, there are such people as Karma Sanyasis. In other words, they renounce all work. This sounds good, doesn't it? I'm sure you like that. Give up all work, right? So we're going to talk about karma yoga and karma sannyas here today. First of all, review. Yeah, in the last class, last week, we presented the overview of Krishna's instructions on jnana. Who would like to tell me one of Krishna's instructions on Gyan? Yes? Don't all speak at once. Yes? Prahlad, tell me Krishna's instructions on Gyan. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Krishna uh, mentioned in the last class we heard about uh, for ashrams, for varna and for ashrams, uh, we have a uh, for 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 the four varna. No, 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 not those instructions. It was more Krishna's instructions on the difference between the body and the soul. Oh yeah. Um. So Krishna tells us how the body is temporary, uh, and it's affected by the three modes of material nature. But the soul is transcendental, eternal, uh, and cannot be destructed, as mentioned in the in the Bhagavad Gita. It mentions how the soul cannot be destroyed by fire, but you know, uh, cut by weapons, and so on. Give me a verse. Yes. Tell me a verse. Nainam chindanti shastrani nainam dhati pavaka na chainam prayanti apo na sosyati marutaha. Okay, good. Do you know? Do you know the translation? Uh, yes, roughly, Maharaj. I think it says uh, the soul can uh, cannot be cut to pieces by any weapon, nor can it be uh, burned by fire, moistened by water, or withered by the wind. Okay, good. So that's one instruction. And there were several other instructions, right? Anybody else can give me another one of Krishna's instructions on Gyan from that section on Bhagavad Gita? Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, I think uh, Bhagavad Gita 2.20. Yes, what does Krishna uh, say? Uh, Krishna says the soul is eternal, primeval, and never existing and unborn. It has no birth, nor death at any time. Do you know the verse? Yes, good, right. For the soul there is never birth nor death, nor having once been, does he ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, ever-existing, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. All right? Like that. And then there's also the who knows the verse about changing clothes. In the second chapter, Krishna c compares the changing of the body to the changing of the dress. 
Who knows? Yes, that... Project Kirtan Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So Krishna talks about the uh, second chapter, uh, 22nd verse. So he tells the uh, Vasham Shijinani, Yada Vihaya, Navani Grinati, Naruparani, Tata Shadirani Vihaya Jinani, Anyani Samyati, Navani Dehi. Yes. Translation, do you know? Yeah. So as as uh, as a person puts on new uh, garment, giving up the old one, similarly, once who leaves the body, uh, accepts another body. Okay. Uh, leaving the old and unused one. All right. Thank you. All right. So this was some of Krishna's instructions on Gyan, explaining the difference between the body and the soul. And how did Krishna use that knowledge to defeat Arjuna's argument? Arjuna had three reasons for not fighting. Which particular reason did the knowledge of Gyan defeat? Compassion. Yes, right. Arjuna's compassion. Arjuna's compassion was based on the body. Real compassion is, should be based on the soul, not on the body. Arjun, Ar, Krishna chastised Arjuna because his compassion was based on the body. What did Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita about this? How did Krishna say it? Did he, how did he tell Arjuna about his compassion? He said, those who are wise, what? What will they do? Yes, thank you, Prabhu. Yes. So, Krishna said to Arjuna, while speaking learned words, Arjuna, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Because Arjuna's compassion was based on the body. So why was Arjuna's compassion based on the body not worthy of anything? What's wrong with that? Yes? Someone? Yes, Because the body is temporary and the soul is eternal. So any compassion, you know, for the body is not going to help a person who is drowning in the, uh, you know, ocean of nehiscence. Okay. So uh, compassion for a uh, materialistic, uh, you know, body is uh, uh, not going to help. Right. So that's why. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaji. Yes. Arjuna's compassion based on the body is useless. So Krishna defeated Arjuna's first reason for fighting, compassion. And then the second reason Arjuna had for not wanting to fight was? What was Enjoyment. It? Enjoyment. Yes, and how did Krishna defeat that argument? Yes, Karma. Uh, Krishna says, even if you fight, then you will go to the heavenly planet. If you don't fight, then uh, uh, you will go to hell because of infamy. Right. If he, if he fights, if he wins, what will happen? He will go to... Uh, uh, he will go to heavenly planet and he is doing his uh, prescribed duty. If he wins the battle, he will enjoy the kingdom. Yes. And if he loses the battle, he'll be killed in the battle, then? Then even uh, he, he, as he's doing the duty, he will go to the heavenly planet. Right. He'll be elevated, right. He will be elevated. Get a higher birth, right. So win or lose, Arjuna will enjoy. But if he doesn't fight, he'll be, his name will be ruined. And yes. for, for one who has been honored, dishonored, is what? For Arjuna, he's used to being honored. But if he becomes, if, he, if people start to dishonor him, then what will it be like for him? It's like death. Worse than death, right. 
dishonor is worse than death. And then the third reason for not fighting was sinful, sinful, right, sinful reactions. Sin. How did our, how did Krishna counter that? By Bhutti Yoga. Bhutti Yoga, yes, Bhutti Yoga or Karma Yoga. Yes, he is telling that to work without the attachment to the fruits. Right, yes. When he and when you work without attachment to the fruit, then no reaction. Of course, you have to perform the duty in a detached manner. And remember, well, we, we'll see, we, we spoke about that. We presented a summary of the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, and we explained about the Bhagavad Gita, how it summarizes the Bhagavad Gita, because within the second chapter you've got some jnana yoga, you've got some karma yoga, and you've got a little glimpse of bhakti yoga there. And so it's described like that. And then we spoke about the relevance of the karma kanda division in the Vedas, in the practice of Krishna consciousness. Everyone remembers? What is the relevance of the karma kanda division in the Vedas? No relevance, Maharaj. Karma kanda is not at all, uh, you know, uh, prescribed right. in Krishna consciousness. Thank you, yes, right. And then. The, the significance of the term pradyavaya navidyate. Pradyavaya navidyate meaning? It means uh, only I am working for Krishna. Pradyavaya navidyate. So, Just responsible? No, means no, no loss or no diminution. Right? There's no, in this endeavor, there's no loss or diminution. And a little advancement made saves us from the greatest danger. Right? Niha bikramana shosti pratyavayo pratyavaya navidyate. In this endeavor, there's no loss or diminution. So you do a little devotional service, you won't lose the benefit. Sometimes you think, oh, oh uh, what benefit am I going to get? No, you get eternal benefit. Other work you do, finish with the body. But if you do devotional service, that's eternal benefit. So that was 240. And then 241, vaya vasayatmika buddhi, meaning? Anybody remember the meaning? Vaya Yes. Has the determination in Krishna Consciousness, Sorry, can you say again? Resolute determination in Krishna Consciousness. All right, yes, thank you. Resolute determination, yes. Those who are fixed on this path are resolute in determination. Their aim is one. The intelligence of those who are irresolute is many-branched, right? So that's... 240. And you can see here the overview of the second chapter. So we covered all these points. The only thing we've not yet covered in the second chapter is this last item. Stita Dir Muni, from verse 254 up to 72. Arjuna asked a question to Lord Krishna. He wanted to know about this Stita Dir Muni, about uh, how do we, how, what is the nature of one who's who's achieved perfection. How does he... Here you can see Arjuna's question. Stita pragnasya kabasa samadhi stasya keshava stita di kim prabhasheta kim asita brajeta kim. Right? So the stita, stita sloka. Arjuna is asking the question about the stita pragna. Stita mean situated and pra -gna, pra gna one who is situated in complete knowledge. What is the nature of one who has achieved perfection? How does he speak and what is, he la what is his language? How does he sit 
and how does he walk? And so our, our Lord Krishna will reply to Arjuna's question about this, right? O oh Krishna, what are the symptoms of one whose consciousness is thus merged in transcendence? And he says, stita, di, stita Dirmuni, or Stita Pragna, fixed in transcendental consciousness. How does he speak, and what is his language? How does he sit, and how does he walk? That's 254. So Arjuna wants to know about the symptoms. He wants to know how does he speak. Does he speak nicely or does he speak harshly? What is his language? Does he speak English or Bengali? Does he say, <laughs> I'm joking of course. What is his language means? What's his manner in speaking? How does he sit? How does he act when he's not using his senses, when he's sitting, restraining his senses? And how does he walk? What does he do when he's using his senses? So we'll see that these questions are answered. First of all, the symptoms, Lord Krishna applies, replies with verse number 55, describing the symptoms of one in transcendental consciousness. And then we get the speech of that, lib of that person in 56 and 57. And how he sits is there in verses 58 up to 63. And then how does he walk? From 64 up to 72, the end of the chapter. So you can see from Arjuna's question, it's going to take us to the end of the chapter. Lord Krishna will reply in detail to Arjuna's points. What are his symptoms? How does he speak and what is his language? How does he sit and how does he walk? Okay, so you make a note of these things, where to fi find these answers. Srila Prabhupada explains, Kabasa, Kabasha, Kabasha, what language? So Prabhupada explains from the purport, speech is the most important quality of any man. It is said that a fool is undiscovered as long as he does not speak. And certainly a well-dressed fool cannot be identified unless he speaks. Uh, it's a purport 254. Prabhupada traveled a lot, you know. He came to America, of course, he came to America first of all by boat, but then later on he traveled in aeroplanes. And for some, quite a few years, from 1966 up to 1977, when Prabhupada departed, uh, Prabhupada was traveling the world and he would go by flight. So he would go to the airports and he would see the people in the airports. He would see how there were many people in the airports well-dressed. They were well-dressed by Western standards. But he also saw that although they were well-dressed, they could not speak very well. They, in other words, they spoke very poor language, very bad language, and he could understand the nature of these people, that they were very materialistic and very strongly attached to sense gratification. So Prabhupada is making this point here, a well-dressed fool cannot be identified unless he speaks. Gorgovinda Maharaj used to tell the story about the the blue jackal, <laughs> you know, what had happened that one day a jackal somehow was covered in a pot of blue paint. So all the other creatures in the jungle, they saw this jackal with all covered in blue and they wondered what kind of creature is this? And the jackal was very clever, 
And the jackal said, yes, I, I, I'm the king of the jungle. So all the other animals, they began to respect this animal which was all covered in blue paint. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what it was until the evening came. But as soon as the sun went down, it became a little dark. Then the jackal began to howl, the way that making the noise which all the jackals make. And as soon as the sun went down and the jackal began to howl, then all the other animals understood. Oh, it's simply a jackal. No, oh, it's a cheater. Get the jackal out of here. It's a rascal. <laughs> so like that, people may dress up very nicely and they look like they're very cultured and educated. But when they actually speak, then they reveal themselves. So the language is very important, Prabhupada said here, the most important quality of any man. All right? Any questions on this? You're okay? Okay, we'll go ahead. 256. Remember, 256 is speaking about speech. Oh, we're still on speech. 56 and 57 are on speech. Okay, so Prabhupada's quote. Accepts all miseries as the mercy of the Lord, thinking himself only worthy of more trouble due to his past misdeeds. And he sees that his miseries, by the grace of the Lord, are minimized to the lowest. Similarly, when he is happy, he gives credit to the Lord, thinking himself unworthy of the happiness. So if we are asked, how does the Stita Pragna view happiness and distress? So it's answered here in this section of the purport, that the, when the Stita Pragna is experiencing happiness, he thinks he's not worthy of the happiness which he's been given. He, under, he thinks it is simply the mercy of, it's the mercy of the Lord, that I'm not worthy of such happiness, but the Lord is encouraging me. Therefore, he is giving me happiness. And when the, when the person is in distress, then how should we think when we're in difficulties? We should think that I'm, I'm meant to suffer much more, but my suffering is being minimized by the grace of the Lord. So in this way, in, when we're in proper knowledge, we will understand everything, happiness and distress, all to be the mercy of the Lord himself. And we go on uh, appreciating the mercy of the Lord. Okay, so that's how we should view happiness and distress. Okay, let me see, what is this? Oh. Kim Asita, how does he sit? In other words, mentally when withdrawing the senses. So we spoke about the symptoms and how does he speak and what is his language now? How does he sit? So the example is given here, you will see, the tortoise or turtle we could say. How they, they go swim in the sea and they come on shore and they lay their eggs on shore. So the turtle has, uh, or the tortoise has, has its limbs, its legs, but when it wants, it can withdraw the legs, withdraw the limbs under the shell, like that. So this is the uh, example, the analogy, which is, is compared to a yogi, how he can withdraw his senses from the material world. He won't get involved with the material world to keep himself away 
from the material world, withdraw himself from the maya, from the illusion, from the sense gratification. And the comparison is there with the tortoise, how he will withdraw his senses and then whenever he wants to do something, he can extend his senses, he, he can exhibit his senses, but he will do so only for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. So this example is given, the turtle, tortoise rather, how he sits, sits, withdraw the senses, bring them in under the shell, and then when you want to do that, just like devotees, what, how does this relate to a devotee in Krishna consciousness? Can anyone understand what would be the comparison? Devotees can withdraw his senses like the productive system. If he can undertake celibacy, but if required, he can produce Krishna conscious children also. No. <laughs> okay. But uh, what about brahmacharis though, like that? How will they do it? Or sannyasis? That's all right, you know, young married couples, they can, <laughs> they can have children they want. But what about brahmacharis and vanaprastas and sannyasis? How are they going to do it? How are they going to restrain their senses or withdraw their senses? Okay, Shpru. Maharaj, Rishikena, Rishikesha, Sevanu Bhakti Ruchyate. Encouraging the senses in the service of the Lord. So, like uh, Amrish Maharaj, Sagan, and Krishna Padar, so all the senses are, in, when they are engaged in the service of the Lord, they automatically become purified. So, by that principle, the end? The, I read in a, I read in a, a book uh, by uh, very senior Sanyasi in this one that a devotee, a man needs a woman and the devotee of the Lord needs the Lord. So, that was the point I understand. Okay, I, I was thinking about uh, the example, I think just simply we, we would chant Hare Krishna. You know, we have our beats and our, our, our chanting back. And so when, when there's n no active service to be done, nothing, you know, you've finished your service, you've done all the cooking, you've done all the cleaning, every, you know, all your duties are finished, then you take shelter of the holy name. You simply chant on your beats and chant the holy name. We take shelter of the holy name. There was a, there was a, a drama which we always used to do about the genie in the bottle. And the genie in the bottle would come out and he would ask, give me something to do. And so then the king would give the genie something to do, but the genie would do everything so quickly. After a while it became difficult to think what to give the genie to do. And so then <laughs> he told the genie, climb up the tree, go up and down the tree. <laughs> So the genie was going up and down the tree and whenever there was something to do then they'd call the genie, go and do that. And so the same way devotees, we, we do our service, we go for sankirtan, we distribute books, we, go, we do cooking and cleaning and when, when we've finished our service then we take shelter of the holy name. We, we have a, and we have of course Prabhupada's books but the, the main thing is the chanting of the holy name. We bring our mind again back to the holy name. So in this way we can withdraw our senses from the material energy, chant by chanting the holy name. Okay, so just like the tortoise, exhibit the senses to serve Krishna, otherwise withdraw the senses. From the purport, text 58, the best example set herein is the tortoise. The tortoise can at any moment wind up its senses and exhibit them again at any time for particular purposes. Similarly, the senses of the Krishna conscious person are used only for some particular purpose in the service of the Lord and are with and are otherwise are, are withdrawn otherwise 
so if there's no service for the Lord, our senses are withdrawn. In other words, we just take shelter of the holy name. All right. Now, another example was given here about withdrawing the senses. And this example is about the snake charmer. Right? The snake charmer, you can see, he's got these cobras or deadly snakes. And he's, he, you know, he's got them under his control. Why? Because he, he's playing on his flute. So by playing on his pipe, he, he's, he's able to control these deadly cobra, cobra snakes. So in a similar manner, our senses are like snakes. They're like poison snakes. Now the snakes are deadly poisonous, but if you cut out the fangs, if you take out the fangs from the, the snakes, then you don't have to worry. Just like sometimes, often in the streets, you may have cobra, then someone may come there with a the cobra and he plays with it. But the cobra actually doesn't have any teeth. The fangs have been removed. And so, uh, the same way, a devotee, his, he has senses, but the fangs are removed because he's chanting Hare Krishna and he's engaging in devotional activities. So his senses are not a problem. He keeps his senses always engaged in the service of Krishna. The devotee. The devotee is a snake charmer. And the senses are like the snake. So we have to keep our senses controlled. Very important. And best is to remove the poison fangs from these snakes so they're not troublesome anymore. There's no fear. And we, we remove the poison from our senses by becoming Krishna conscious. The more we're focused on Krishna, then we don't have to fear the senses. All right, now, so a little activity for you. How many devotees are here today? 47, Maharaj. How many? Seven? 47, 47. Oh, 47. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so... Uh, how are we going to do it? 47, 48, 6, 48, 6. Um, and it, uh, okay, we'll have groups of, of six people. I think we could get eight groups, right? Six, yes, people, six people in a group, right? And we want, we want you to discuss an example from personal experience when you try to control the senses unsuccessfully. I hope you all have some experience of this, some personal experience, when you did try to control the senses unsuccessfully. No. Okay, sometimes you may have been successful, but often we're not successful. We try. Or, Alternatively, when you forgot about sense enjoyment entirely. And so examples from your personal experience, either when you try to control the senses unsuccessfully, or you forgot about sense enjoyment entirely. All right, so we have eight groups, is it? Six people in a group. So we'd like you to discuss these points and uh, nominate someone as your spokesman and we'll hear what you discussed. We'll give you, what, seven minutes? Seven minutes, is that all right Prabhu? Yes? Yes, yes, yes Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. Okay. Okay, you can go into the groups. Yes, sir.
Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanu Pranam. Hare Krishna Prabhu, my obeisances, all glories to Prabhupada. Prabhuji, uh, I just wanted to give my personal example when you try to control the sense, uh, senses unsuccessfully. Uh, uh, it's a recent example. Uh, I used to uh, play cricket uh, and uh, we have services on uh, every Sunday. We have uh, uh, all programs here. Uh, so we have to go for book distribution. So there, I have only one choice, whether I should go for a book distribution and stay there or I should go for playing cricket. So what happened, I always think, what should I do? So uh, there is a sense gratification that, you know, playing cricket. So I sometimes I used to uh, leave playing cricket and I used to go for the book distribution. And now at present, I have totally uh, left going uh, playing cricket and I'm just uh, going for the whole programs and service. Okay. I, I read Bhakti Charu Swami also used to play cricket before becoming a devotee. Yes, Prabhupada. <laughs> he was quite a re renowned batsman, he said. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's good. You give up. You got the higher taste, maybe, right? Yes. Yes, Prabhupada. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, I don't know it is because of my uh, age or because, because of my bhakti. Kindly let me know. I am just uh, describing the fact. During my class 8 standard, I, have, I, I had a private tutor. He was a follower of Swami Sarupananda Paramahamsadi in Bengal. Um, he was an impersonalist. Uh, so their, their uh, motto was character building. So one of the daily activity was that uh, whomever the woman uh, or girl you find, you will consider uh, her as a mother in your mind. So you have to write the dinner look, daily diary also, whether you have um, considered every woman as your mother or not. There are strict regulations every day. We have to write 30 days diary and the teacher used to check. How many days was uh, yes, yes, or how many days it spoke? But uh, I found that uh, whatever artificially uh, we, we try to impose our, in our mind that she is our mother, she was our mother, maybe because of that age uh, or uh, the process didn't act properly. So I could not uh, find uh, in totality that she is my mother, mental condition, in mind. Now, at the, uh, whenever I have crossed in my 50, 50s, so and I start my bhakti also for uh, 10 years or so, so I find less interaction uh, towards women. So I don't know if it is uh, as a result of bhakti or harinam chanting or due to the, my age factor. It's, uh, well, it's not important why, but we're just just thankful that we can come to the higher consciousness. Right. It may be due to it may every, everything may be helpful to you to come to this higher stage. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, did you have any actual experience of where you uh, give up thought of sense gratification entirely? Yeah, Maharaj, uh, 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 I have stopped uh, watching, taking news in TV. I don't find any interest there. Oh, good. You've stopped watching television. Television. No more, newspaper also. no more movies. No more movies. Okay. Good. So you can take shelter of the holy name and the Srimad Bhagavatam. And 
So you, you had the example, you were endeavouring to control your senses, but you failed, right? Initially. You were trying to control, you were trying to give up thinking of women, you are just trying to think of women as your mother, but you couldn't do it. Right. Right? But now that you're in Krishna consciousness, now you're not, now you're not attached, you're not affected. Hmm? And you're a single man, is it? I'm married. Oh, you're married? Okay. And your wife is also a devotee? She is uh, not that serious. But she's not against, she's favorable. She's not, she's not against. Okay. So that's the main point. Okay. Yes, anybody else in this group have any experience controlling the senses and failing? Yes? Who is this? Dev Patel, Prabhu? Dev Patel, yes? Oh, are you controlling your senses? In eating prasada, I'm not that much. Okay, we're going back to the main session. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna, welcome back. Yes, Maharaj. All right, who would like to tell us about your group's discussion? Did anybody in your group have a, a nice uh, example about trying to control their senses but failing? Yes, Maharaj, I have a few devotees. So I'll start with the Nipta Lila Mata. Yes, go ahead. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yeah, so we discussed that, uh, uh, like, some points that uh, some people came up. Um, one is electronics. Sometimes we are trying to control the usage of electronics, but it is difficult when you are free. It is difficult to control. But uh, when you are engaged in um, devotional services like preparing bhoga or uh, some temple activities or some festivals, you don't even uh, uh, look at the phone. You don't uh, use the electronics that much. So uh, both both the things uh, in general, it is difficult sometimes. But the second question that you are able to control is when uh, there are festivities in the temple and you are engaged in the services. Another thing was also about um, ekadashi. Ekadashi. Uh, normally, sometimes, if even if you decide to not eat certain things or sweets or anything, but uh, you're you're uh, sometimes giving it up, so you you're not able to control that. But when there is ekadashi, you very strongly do it because uh, you chant more, you do your sadhana, and also you're doing it for Krishna, so you get some power. So on ekadashi is. E it's easier and even if you break the ekadashi you feel more guilty than usual if if you are not able to do so oh, okay and also if you are if you are getting too many thoughts you don't want to think about some subject but you are not able to control but uh, if you chant it the, the the thought automatically appears insignificant so yes these are the points very nice yeah. very very nice examples very good very nice work. Mm, I, I like this one. very good. <laughs> electronic games, electronic devices. Oh yeah, so you can, some people waste so much time in the course of the day. There, I know even devotees, initiated devotees, somehow, you know, their job, they're, they're maybe in a shop or something like that, shopkeeper. So not much business, not much to do, and they just sit there and, and instead of reading or chanting, they play with the mobile phone. Oh, and it's such a bad habit, such a very difficult habit to give up. They get so engrossed in it. 
But as you say, if there's some nice activity at the temple, a nice festival, they can become so absorbed and they can forget all about it. And so yes, very good, very nice examples. Okay, I think we'll go ahead. I think th those, that was a very good discussion there, very nice results. Okay, we're going to go on to the next section here. Let's see what Prabhupada says about this param dristva nivartate, right? The param, the higher taste, right? That's a, that though one may rest, restrain the senses from sense objects, but the taste for sense objects remains. But see, seeking such pleasure, he, 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 he can experience a higher taste and become fixed in consciousness, right? So Prabhupada explains, one who has tasted the beauty of the Supreme Lord Krishna in the course of his advancement in Krishna consciousness no longer has a taste for dead material things. The dead material things, right? movies, cricket matches, mm, Bollywood sh movies, these kind of card games and electronic games, they're all dead material things. If we've actually tasted the pleasure of Krishna consciousness, then we won't be attracted to these things. So we really do want to get that higher taste that it's very important for us to experience that. Higher taste, and of course, in order to get that taste, we have to purify ourselves. Initially, we may not taste just like chanting of the holy name. There's a lot of nectar, so much nectar in the holy name. But if we're conditioned ourselves, if we're contaminated by sense gratification, we won't be able to taste the pleasure or the nectar in the holy name. So we do have to purify ourselves before we can experience it higher taste. All right, and then karma yoga is superior to karma sannyas. Karma yoga means doing one's duty in a detached manner. In other words, we give the we give the results. We sacrifice the results for others. And karma sannyas is giving up work. You don't want to work. You don't want to do anything. So, uh, in Bhagavad Gita we see uh, Arjuna talking about giving up his duty. He said, he said to Krishna, he said, it would be better to live in this world by begging. Arjuna was thinking about living by begging rather than performing his duty where he would have to fight and kill people like Bhishma and Drona. So Arjuna was actually thinking about this karma sannyas. His duty was to actually do karma yoga, but he was thinking that he would be better to do karma sannyas. He, he thought it would be better to live by begging. We want to understand these uh, two choices. Doing karma yoga means act, performing one duty detached from the result, and karma sannyas giving up the work altogether. So we quote here this verse from the second chapter, text number 48. Yoga stakura karmani sangam takva dhananjaya. Lord Krishna is speaking to Arjuna, perform your duty equipoised, Arjuna, abandoning all attachment to success or failure. So that is karma yoga. Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna, do your duty, but give up the attachment to being successful or even failing. That's not important. Some people, they, oh, they, if they're successful, they rejoice, and if they fail, they lament. But in karma yoga, there's no failure 
in trying to serve Krishna. There's no question of failure for a devotee in trying to do some service for the pleasure of the Lord. And just like the example is given, Lord Nityananda went with Haridas Thakur and they went to try to get Jagai and Madhai to chant. Now, at the first attempt, they failed. And Lord Nityananda and Haridas Thakur had to run to save their lives. They were chased by Jagai and Madhai. But there was no failure because they made the attempt. They made the attempt. So, and Prabhupada always encouraged the devotees like that, that don't be attached to the results. Sometimes we may be successful and other times we may fail. But the results are given by Krishna. We're not the doer. We're simply the instruments. And a devotee doesn't think he's the doer. The devotee understands everything is done by Lord Krishna, he, and he will give the credit to Krishna. Just like uh, long ago, 1970, the devotees, they did a big Pandal program in India. I think it was in New Delhi, and they had a very big Pandal program. And many people came and it was very successful. You know, our movement was very new and we had a lot of nice Western devotees. And Prabhupada was there and Prabhupada was giving classes. And he brought deities also at that time. Radha uh, Partha Sarati, who are now, now installed there in east of Kailash. They were at the Pandal program and many people came. And the program was very successful. And afterwards, you know, one devotee was saying, oh, we did it, we did it, it was so great, it was so wonderful, so many people came, they're so impressed. But Prabhupada said to the devotee, we didn't do anything, Krishna did it. So this should be the mood of the devotee. We are the instruments in the hands of Krishna. Krishna is the actual doer. And so in this way we should be detached from success and failure. So that is karma yoga, doing, a, doing what's required, do the duty, don't be attached. <clears throat> then in the fifth chapter, verse number two, Lord Krishna explains, he's comparing karma yoga and sannyas, karma sannyas, and so he says, tayos tu karma sannyasat, Karma Yoga Vishishyate. Of the two, work in devotional service. In other words, Karma Yoga is better than renunciation of work. Renunciation of work being Karma Sanyas. So work in devotion is better than renunciation of work. We want to understand why. So, to help you understand that, we, we want you to do this, some exercises here. <laughs> Actually, we've said here, drawings. And so, if, if you can draw something, very nice. If you're not able to draw something, then you will have to explain. You may like to even do a drama, or you may like to just nominate a speaker. If you can do a drama, then so much better. But uh, we have different sections here. here. One, two, three, four, five. There are five groups, you see. So how many? We have 47 here today? Yes, Maharaj. Right. So maybe we'll put what? Uh, we'll, we'll, can we have five groups? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so there will be like 10, 10, 10. Ten and then seven, or and, yeah, the last group will be seven. Maharaj, can you put the question also? Yes, yeah, just no. a minute. Yeah, okay. We'll go back to the question, but just let's see. So we'll have five groups. So there'll be like there's going to be about ten people in each group. So you're a lot of people. So you have to share out the work. You know. 
somebody can do the maybe do a drawing and somebody else has to uh, get the main points from the purports and you have to put it together and if you can make a little skit, a little drama, you can present it for us. That would be very nice. Anyway, group, group one will do verses 60 and 61 of the second chapter. Group two will do 62 to 63. Group three will do verses 67 to 68. And then group four will go to the third chapter, verses number four and five. And group five will do the third chapter, text number six, seven and eight. Right? So five groups, and here's what you want. What we want, we want you to show reasons why karma yoga is superior to karma sannyas. This is the main point of this exercise. We want you to bring out reasons why karma yoga is superior to karma sannyas. And you can do it in different ways. You can do it from, by showing, using, if you can draw an illustration or if you can do a little drama somehow to show us, or you can simply have uh, some uh, speaking, debating even, conversation, or some uh, speaker to present to us. Right? So the main point is we want to know why karma yoga is superior to sannyas, karma sannyas. And here are the verses again. All right? So, we'll give you ten minutes to work on this. All right? Have you got the groups, Prabhu? Yeah? Five groups? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Hare Krishna. Okay, which text are we doing? Uh, we are doing 2.60 to 2.61. Okay. I think we can make a skit this time. We can make a what? Okay. We can do a drama this time. Really? Yeah. How are you going to do it? What's your plan? Um, I could go through the perfect ones and understand the concept and then maybe come up with a story. All right. Let's go through the perfect one. Okay.
Hare Krishna Maharaj. In this thing, I am seeing, you know, two big examples on which I think we can do skit on. Is one is the Vishwamitra, that how, uh, you know, when Menaka tries to, uh, you know, seduce him because he was a great yogi and a sannyasi. So you can always say that rather than taking sannyas, sitting at one place, always meditating and doing nothing else, like, you know, renouncing uh, the other wife's work and not concentrating on Krishna consciousness. So you can have a fall down. Yeah. And the same is the story of Durvasa Muni also that, uh, you know, Amrish Maharaj, he was a great devotee. And on the other side, Durvasa Muni was also, he was also great sage and a yogi also. But still, you know, he had that thing, you know, like uh, the, the jealousy or, you know, the uh, uh, intensity of taking revenge. So that's why, you know, uh, he, uh, you know, he incurred some demon and, uh, uh, you know, to kill the Amrish Maharaj. But Amrish Maharaj was so polite that he still, you know, forgave him. So I think this is how, like, devotion is on a higher platform. Yes. So that is how we can show that somehow. Right. Sri Lakshmi, do you have anything uh, to say on this? How do we act on this? Uh, maybe we can um, compare two sages. Either one, two of the, any two people from a group can be two sages. And then one of us can be the narrator. And one sage can depict the person who's trying to, um, who's getting agitated by the, uh, worldly senses and he is getting attracted to the material materialistic things around him whereas the other uh, stage he is completely engrossed in the in his meditation and he is uh, meditating upon Krishna and that's at last he um, finally gets Krishna consciousness and then yeah that is what I was thinking since when I went through the purpose I like the idea I think you can do this uh, yeah. So two persons is, uh, uh, you know, one would be acting as um, who? The, uh, the sage one. one. Vishwamitra. Sage two and one is Marita. Next time is setting. Yeah. So, uh, anybody want to volunteer to be the sage or uh, sage one and sage two? Sage oh. two. Okay. <laughs> Pee Maji can be sage two. Durvasa. And... And uh, Maharaj, do you want to go? Do you want to act as one of the stage? Oh, I better not take part in the <laughs> drama, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm already in the drama every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, what about Chaman? Where do you want to do stage one? You think I look like stage Okay, anybody else? Sunandan, Das Prabhuji, Hishikesh Prabhuji. Uh, Nitishwarupa Mataji, would you like to do? How about this? Uh, 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 and we'll ask someone that needs to go for the Okay, yeah. fine. I'll go for the sage one. And then one of, so, one suppose, of the devotees. Suppose, yeah. uh, suppose Vishwamitra, how can I perform, how can I uh, act uh, as a Vishwamitra? What is my role? Uh, we can... Um, Prabhuji, if you become Vishwamitra, uh, uh, Rishi, then one of you, one, maybe Nitya Sarupa Mataji can become Menakha. And you know, she can show as if she's walking by and then uh, uh, Vishwamitra is slowly opening his eyes and seeing <laughs> and getting attracted. So in that way, he's getting diverted from what his ultimate goal was and then he goes towards that. But Durvasa Muni, which is Pihu Mataji, she can, uh, no matter what happens, maybe Samanvai or Dhruva, both of you can do something shenanigans in the background. But uh, Durvasa Muni is like affected, <laughs> not affected by any of them. You can show that you're completely engrossed in your meditation. So in this way, you can show the, we can at last, the narrator can like say, this is a, uh, compare the topics given in the both. Yoga and the yoga sanyasa. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Vishwamitra, Vishwamitra can be doing either silent meditation or else it can be chanting Om or doing pran yeah. pranayama or something like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Sunandan so Das Prabhuji, can you become Vishwamitra? Yes, uh, I simply chant Om. Okay. Yeah, and if you sort of a Mataji, you can become the main account. I'll do like this. I'll do like this. Yeah, yeah. And Pihu Mataji, Durvasa Muni, 
Dhruva and Samanbhai, both of you, you can be the people who are trying to distract Dhruva, Dhruva Samani, okay? Um, and maybe, you know, somebody, when you are trying to distract Dhruva Samani, somebody can like do this or something, he could phone or something important, you know, is there. So he is not distracted in this. Okay. Yeah, you can do it in that way and then narrator, narrator. Let's make our I'll be just doing Hari Ram chanting. Okay. Yes, I'm going to continue. We can put up virtual background and it also gives us the setting on how it gives us some depth to. Background? Uh, I sent it in the uh, chat. Yeah, I mean, is, it, is there anyone who cannot add the background? I think. Okay, I have. Okay, so um, let's just. Uh, so uh, I am chanting Om. I'm yeah, just continue chanting Om as uh, Nitya Surupa Mataji will be walking by. You can either open like one of your eyes and start smiling, and then like you know you can show like you're going behind her, <laughs> and then the narrator will be like the next case is where Durvasa Muni is under his uh, meditation, and then we'll. Uh, show Pihu Mataji going with her meditation, chanting the Harinam. At that time, Dhruva and uh, Samanvai, both of you will come and do as we told you to do. And uh, in the end, can someone tell me what I have to tell in the end to conclude the skit? Like, can someone tell? Yeah, something I said in the beginning, you know. Purpose yeah. uh, will have, uh, like, 60. Purpose has that uh, conclusion, Mataji. Since my mind has been engaged in the service of Lucas, we can now uh, include these statements as it is. <coughs> so, should I start like this? Hare Krishna, everyone. So, today we'll be presenting a drama on the comparison between a uh, sage who practices karma yoga and a sage who practices karma sannyasa. So let's start with the sage who practices karma sannyasa. And then that time, so Sunandan Das Prabhuji will say that, does that. And then uh, later I'll say, now let's go to Durvasa Muni who practices karma yoga. And then Piyu Mataji will do. And then I'll just read the purport of the second, second sloka, 2.61. Pihu Mataji, uh, just add the background on me so it gives a bit depth. I sent it in the chat. The virtual background, Mataji. You shared the file, right? Yes, I shared the file. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna. So, five more minutes, please. Five more minutes, please. Five more minutes. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't think you need five more minutes, it just, just work with what you've got, because we, we have to go on, we want to see the different groups, it's all going to take time, we don't want to take too much time. All right, group one, everyone's back? Yes, Maharaj. All right, so group one, the first, those group, those devotees in group one, they had a drama ready, right? So, Nitya Swarupataji, are you from group one? Yes. Yes. So, please go. So, the uh, narrator of our script is Sri Lakshmi Mataji. Uh, may I please request you to... Yeah, yes, Prabhupada Hare Krishna everyone, so today we'll be presenting a skit on the comparison between karma yoga practicing sages and the sages that practices karma sannyasa. So first we'll be presenting the sage who practices karma sannyasa. Here we have Sage Vishwamitra who is engrossed in his meditation and at that time Menaka passes by. 
Vishwamitra, the sheep gets distracted and starts going behind her, gets attracted to her. Next, we'll be seeing the example of Durvasa Muni who follows the example of Karma Yoga. Priyamathiji, please unmute your mics. Samanvay and Dhruv, all of you, unmute your mics. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. In this way, as we all can see, the master money is, may, is may not affected by any of the distractions going behind his surroundings. In this way, we can understand a karma yogi is a, is a one who restrains his senses, keeping them under full control and fixes his consciousness upon Lord Sri Krishna. And that man is of a steady intelligence. Hare Krishna. You're, you're saying Durvasa Muni. I think it should be Ambarish, isn't it, who's restraining the senses? Yes, Prabhu Maharaj, but then we have taken Durvasa Muni as the person who is uh, um, representing Karma Sanyasa, uh, Karma Yoga in the drama. But then an uh, actual uh, example of Karma Yoga would be uh, Ambarish Maharaj. Okay, so the Karma Yogi, he's just chanting Hare Krishna. But the Karma Sanyasi was chanting Om. So is that the difference? If you chant Om, it's Karma Sanyas? No, Maharaj, it's actually um, in the Karma Sanyas, as you could see, he was getting distracted by what was going behind him. But whereas uh, the person who was uh, going, um, practicing Karma Sanyas um, Yoga was fully engrossed in his uh, um, meditation and was not affected by any of the distractions behind him. He was uh, completely restrained all the senses and he was um, keeping them under full control and he had his consciousness fixed upon Lord Sri Krishna. Okay. So, one who restrains the senses. But just because we stop, as you said, the karma sannyasi, his position was not secure and he fell down, he became a victim to the the Menaka. But the Karma Yogi, his position is secure because he engaged in the service of Lord Krishna, he's connected to Krishna. The karma Sanyasi, he has no he has no connection to Krishna. He's just given up work. Okay. Any questions? Anybody want to ask this group anything? Okay, we'll go to the next group, group number two. Yes, go on. What text are you doing? Group number two. Raj, 2.62 and 63. Okay, 62 and 63. Yeah. Okay. 
you go ahead, Mara? Yes, please. Maharaj, uh, verse 2.62, the prophet uh, Prabhupada says, uh, the senses require real engagements, and if they are not engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, they will uh, certainly seek engagement in the service of materialism. So to corroborate uh, this particular statement by Prabhupada, we could think of an analogy of uh, a lion, uh, which is taught very well to behave in, in circus, and uh, there is a, a particular trainer of the lion which is present at the time of uh, his uh, uh, the, at the time of uh, the play. So uh, here uh, the tiger is uh, the lion is taught in such a way that he has to move in particular path. He has a lot of strength. It, it becomes a very very nice spectacle if the uh, you know lion listens to the. Uh, to his trainer, to his master, he jumps over and runs, uh, jumps through the fire circles also, and it looks very nice. So people enjoy it. On the contrary, if if at all the lion, you know, does not listen to the trainer, it has been seen that uh, there have been instances when the lion jumps towards the crowd and actually becomes a man eater, and there have been instances when the lion eats the trainer also. So the analogy here depicts the lion. Here is the mind. And if it is trained properly, it, it is very nice. Everything goes smooth. And if it is not trained properly, it can create havoc. So uh, these are the distractions of the mind, the other people who are there. But, uh, it requires proper engagement, as stated by Prabhupada. So this is the analogy that I can think of. And there are two other devotees, Viswas Prabhu, who will add to this. Okay, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I like to supplement uh, uh, that uh, in the analogy it is found that Lord Shiva was practicing karma sannasa, uh, just uh, meditating. So he, he could not control his senses. He had to unite with Mata Parvati to give birth of Kartikya. Whereas we find that Haridas Thakur who was doing uh, uh, karma yoga uh, uh, in uh, uh, serving Krishna, uh, then uh, Maya could not uh, overcome him. He could defeat Maya. Uh, and uh, another another analogy is that uh, this Jamuna Charya, he, he has told that he, uh, in his youth he was king, he enjoyed his life like anything. So when he, uh, he has taken Krishna consciousness, he has written that Jadvati Mama Cheta Krishna Padar Binde it means whenever we are engaged in Krishna consciousness, we are performing karma yoga, it is better than karma sannyas. Another example is that the impersonalist. They think that everything is material, they, so they, 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 they do not accept anything. But whereas devotees, they accept good things. They offer it to Krishna and uh, they take uh, partake that prasadam. So they enjoy their life also. So it is said that karma yogis are better placed than karma sannyasis. Okay. Yes. Anyone else to add to this? Okay, the two verses are there, right? Uh, Dhyayato vishayam pumsa sangas teshu pajayate. By contemplating the objects of the senses, a person becomes attached to them. Oh no, uh, what is it? Yes. While contemplating the objects of the senses, a person becomes attached to them. And from such attachment, lust develops. And then from lust, anger arises. So we see also uh, when the senses are not controlled then it gives way to lust. So lust, the enemy of man. We'll be hearing about lust in the third chapter. At the end of the third chapter lust is described. So the enemy, lust, and from lust comes anger. So lust gives way to the anger. Anger is like the younger brother of lust. So lust, anger and greed, three gates to hell, 
all sane men have to avoid these things. We have to be very careful. So contemplating the senses, we become attracted. We must therefore keep the senses engaged. If the senses are not engaged in Krishna consciousness, then we become attracted to the material energy and we think how to enjoy. There's a saying, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. If we don't keep the mind busy in the service of Krishna, then the devil will come by and will engage our mind in his service. So very important to keep the mind always focused in Krishna. All right, we'll go ahead, group number three. What text were you doing? Well, it's 67 and 68. 67? Yes? And 68. And 68. Okay, yes? Okay, so who's in the group? What would you like to do for us? Maharaj, we have a small skit to present. Okay. So here it goes, there are two screens. Hello, hello, this is DBC. Uh, we have come to uh, Allahabad Sangam. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, with the, all these yogis and sadhus here. And I can see this guy, this guy right over here, this Baba hasn't spoken for the past 30 years. Look at this guy, so composed, so satisfied and in his own uh, world, he's, he's just at peace with everything. So here, here comes the Baba. So he's thinking like that. How long do I have to sit like this? I don't know. Uh, okay, let me try. I haven't spoken for the past 30 years. Oh, oh, oh. what's what I have? And one more day. Another day, let me get some time. Yeah. Let me get some accolades from people. Yeah. So that's the uh, Baba. He's uh, not speaking. And then there's a devotee who's uh, constantly engaged in the Harinam Sankirtan of the Lord, uh, glorifying the Lord. So, Rajan Prabhu, can you start now? Um, we were talking about uh, Amrish Maharaj before, that Prabhupada says that Amrish Maharaj, is, he engaged all his senses in Krishna's service, that is uh, karma yoga, action in Krishna consciousness. So he, he chants, he engages all his senses in Krishna's bhakti. And here comes the Dhruvasamini, he tried to harm Amrish Maharaj, but he was not disturbed at all. So Prabhupada says that the uh, senses, one of the roaming senses uh, on which the mind focuses can carry away men's intelligence. So, uh, and Amrish Maharaja's senses were not um, roaming. So he was a bhakti yogi, uh, action in Krishna consciousness, karmi yogi. And bhakti yogi, karmi yogi, so action in Krishna consciousness. He was not disturbed by any any action of uh, the Vasamani. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Prabhu Mataji, Dandar uh, Tanam. So in our group, so the conclusion is uh, the Mukes Prabhu um, giving the example of what is the uh, Karma Yoga is superior to Karma Sanya. So we can see that there is a um, sadhu which is um, not talking at all for uh, uh, like the kids and then it's kind of, um, I mean, it, there is no connection to Bhakti Yoga. So uh, it's, it's um, the comparison to the devotee who is singing the Harinam. Um, it's more like beneficial than the, you know, than the uh, uh, Samadhi or what he did, you know, for educates that doesn't speak nothing, but probably he gets some mystical power, but doesn't have any beneficial to the bhakti. So, and then the uh, 
um, Mataji explain as the the text six sixty seven. So uh, as a strong mind sweeps away a boat on the water. So even one of the ruling senses on which the mind focuses can carry away a man's intelligence. So if we are not engaging our mind, our senses in devotional services, so it's very easy to be swept away. <laughs> so that's all our group. Thank you very much. Yes. Very easy to be swept away if the mind and senses are not properly focused. So we have to always keep all the mind, all the senses in the mind properly engaged. Okay. Yes, we have two more groups, right? Group number four. Yeah, we are group number four, Maharaj. On the third so, chapter, right? Yes, third chapter. Text number two. Three point four and five. Three point four and five. Oh, four and five, okay. Yeah, so we are doing a skit on Narad Muni uh, uh, and uh, Grihastha uh, uh, and uh, uh, Lord Narayan. So we have our spokesperson Radhita. Uh, if you can unmute and start describing the stories and introduce yes, the characters. Yeah. Thank Hare you. Krishna. So we are going to present a drama to show that Karma Yoga is uh, better than Karma Sanyasa. So we have uh, Lord Narayana and we have Narada and Agrihastha. So uh, Nar Nar Narmuni was very happy that he was uh, he's always able to remem uh, remember the names of Lord Narayan. And uh, one day Nar uh, Nar Narayan asks uh, Narad Muni to carry a, a bucket of water without spilling the, um, without even spilling a drop of water. Oh Narada, can you please take this pot full of water and go all around the world without even dropping one drop of water? Yes, Narayana. Okay, okay. you can go. In the water pond, oh my god, something happened. Yes, Narayana, I didn't drop a drop of water and I carried the bucket. Narad Muni finishes his uh, finishes his uh, work and comes back to Lord Narayana. Then Lord Narayana asks Narada, Oh Narada, have you fulfilled the task I have given you? Yes, Narayana, I did it. Oh, Narada, let me ask you a question. When you were going all around the world carrying that pot of water, did you ever think of my name? How is it possible, Narayana? I have to keep the water, I have to not spill the, any drop of water from the bucket. So how is it possible to remember you when I have to concentrate completely on the bucket? But Narada, when you were walking all around the world carrying the water, didn't you see a grahastha? Yes, Narayana. On the other hand, the grahastha was able to do his duty and at the same time remember the Lord. My dear children, let's start to chant and do hardly. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. All right, children, uh, I finished my chanting. I need to go to office. Bye. So, now we can understand that Karma Yoga is better than Karma Sanyasa. Thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> okay. Karma Yoga is better than Karma Sanyas. All right, we have one more group. Group 5. What text are you doing? Hi, uh, Krishna Guru Maharaj. Um, for group 5, we are doing tech, uh, chapter 3, text 6 to 8. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so we will not be doing any drama, Maharaj. We will just be presenting uh, our conclusions in point form. So, um, Hare Krishna, just I want to say I have kept ready one drawing on it. 
Okay, Mataji. We can add up. Mataji, can you also show the drawing? First, I show the drawing. Is that okay? Yes, please. Yes, of course, yes. Mataji. Uh, this is a bottle. Just now I made it. Oh. This is a show person, show show person, bottle yogi, who is a fraud yogi, and he is uh, just showing with his clothes that he is yogi and sitting at a secluded place and he thinking only about money and the women, and people are giving him money just uh, for uh, sense gratification. They want to fulfill their dreams and they uh, went there and. Uh, this is that kind of yogi even he is also not satisfied and the people are also not satisfied because they are caught by maya mm. uh, due to their senses so and this picture i have already made for his grace mahatma prabhu for his japa workshop so this is the uh, karma yogi who is uh, having uh, who just left the few duties that just because of ch his chanting he, the plugs are out but when the plugs are in, he is following all the duties for his family and he always remember Krishna and look at his mind, how he is so happy. <laughs> oh, very nice. Very good. Wonderful. Thank you, Maharaj. So the, the, the japa, when, is, when they're unplugged, what's happening? Uh, when he's unplugged, he is so happy and he is only remembering Krishna. You can see all plugs are out from the uh, plugins. Even I have the previous picture also if you want to see. So here, uh, here all plugs are in. The, oh, yeah. All plugs are in. Yeah. So don't chant while you are plugged in. And here he is taking out his plugs while chanting. So all uh, worries, plans, to to list, work, uh, whatever family duties he is taking out, he is pulling out the plugs. And again plugs started walking, like our senses again started walking uh, back to the plug point. But he realizes that this is not good, so he controlled his senses uh, through his intelligence. So then he is finally chanting unplugged and he is feeling the bliss of Krishna. <laughs> okay, very nice. Thank you, Guru yes. Maharaj. All Krishna's service. Jai Shila Prabhupada. Jai Gurudev. Jai Shila Prabhupada. All right, Prahlad, we will hear from you also. Yes, Maharaj, thank you very much. Sorry, Krishna, and uh, all Jai Shila Prabhupada. So, uh, we first, uh, based on chapter, uh, initially text 5, I think, it said that it is mentioned that um, to, if you want to become a sannyasi, you have to be pure at heart because the sannyasi, Shila Prabhupada says, the sannyasi is compared to, you know, Lord Narayan. So we should not just become a sannyasi, you know, without first achieving purity of heart. Uh, but however, in the material world, currently in Kali Yuga, many people are becoming sannyasi. They're becoming uh, pretenders. So in text 6, Prabhupada calls them uh, pretenders who, you know, their mind is focused on sense enjoyment. So when they become a sannyasi, it's not to dedicate their lives to serving the Lord. Rather, it is to get uh, followers, it's to gain followers, you know, for fame, for wealth, you know, so they want to cheat the society, Prabhupada mentions that, and um, therefore, whatever knowledge that this sannyasi uh, presents has no value, because the effects of, uh, of a sinful man's knowledge are taken away by the Lord's illusory energy. So therefore, uh, such a sannyasi, a pretender is impure. And it will also make us impure, have bad effects on us, and they will lead us astray. So that is our karma sannyas. But um, for karma yoga, however, in, in text 7, the uh, Prabhupada also mentions that all of these different uh, ashrams, like, you know, Grihashta ashram, uh, all of them, they are, they are also uh, 
they can also help us achieve the goal of life. That's why they were created. So it's not, you know, it's not that only if you are a sannyasi we can achieve perfection. Even as a grihastha, we can achieve perfection. Uh, and there are many examples. Like, uh, for example, um, someone who is working in, you know, uh, let's say, uh, Shatriya. So, like, um, you know, the king in Jagannath Puri who would always, uh, you know, sweep the floor every Radha Yatra. So he was the Kshatriya, but yet, you know, despite his uh, duties, he, he did his he performed his duties as a king. Nonetheless, he still made sure he performed devotional service as well. That way, he achieved uh, perfection of life. And also, Kola Vechar Sridhar, uh, associate of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, was very righteous uh, when he was, you know, he was selling just banana leaf plates and some banana foods. So he performed his duty. But yet he made sure he performed his sadhana every day and therefore he was a very close associate of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, Karma Yoga is uh, better than Karma Sanyas because we prioritize uh, serving Krishna over just trying to escape and you know, serve our senses. Okay, yes. So, honest service to, honest service to Krishna is appreciated more than uh, charlatan approach than the deceitful person who makes a show of being a servant of Krishna. All right, is anybody else there in the group to present or to say anything? No, no, no. Okay. All right, so let's go back to where we were. Okay. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question, good question. Okay. So, uh, it's uh, Prabhupada mentions in purport of 3.4 uh, and 3.5 that uh, uh, work is required, prescribed duties are required to purify oneself. Uh, one should not take prematurely sannyas, uh, he should purify himself. At the same time, if one is uh, completely engaged in devotional service, if his work is prescribed duties are not done well, then also he it is fine. So, when uh, when uh, does a person know that if he is purified or not? When is uh, it's the right time for him to say if he is inclined? You mean to take sannyas? Yeah, to take sannyas or completely engage in devotional service. And completely engage in devotional service, dedicate himself fully to the service yeah. of Krishna. Well, one has to be guided by superior authorities. That we say the authorities are sadhu, shastra and guru. So one should actually uh, seek confirmation or seek the blessings from the superior authorities. You should have a spiritual master, you should have mentors who can guide you and can advise you about that. You don't want to do anything independently or prematurely. That's another point, you know, you don't want to try, it, it shouldn't be a premature thing that you want to renounce. So you have to consider this thing carefully. Now Srila Prabhupada himself only changed his position, his ashram, with the greatest reluctance. And it was only after a lot of thought and a lot of consideration and encouragement also from his other uh, sannyasi godbrothers that he actually moved on into other ashrams. So it shouldn't be a premature, it shouldn't be an impulsive thing. Thank you, Maharaj. It must, it, it must be confirmed by the authorities, spiritual authorities. Hmm. One more question, Maharaj. So uh, it says that Param Drishtva Nivartate, that uh, when one is engaged, uh, has higher taste, they can give up the lower taste. So it's like, you know, how, how can we engage kids, children in a way that, you know, they get the higher taste uh, in Krishna consciousness? <laughs> well, <laughs> how to engage, you want children to get the higher taste. <laughs> Generally, uh, we encourage the young children, we give them very nice prasada, that's very important with, with all devotees. The, the nice prasadam, we say the way to man's heart through the tongue. 
And so young children also, they have tongues and they enjoy nice prasadam. So you give them very nice prasadam, you have to have also very nice programs. You have to encourage them and uh, give them the opportunity to engage themselves and to feel like they're contributing something. We encourage the young children, you know, let them do kirtan if they can. They take up the kirtan and to, they can even give lectures and classes, they can give classes, they can tell stories to each other. We have to inspire them so that they can experience a higher taste. So a lot of it is going to, got to come, come from us, that we, can, we give them that kind of opportunity to show their own, uh, to, to develop their own initiative, their own potential as devotees. So Krishna consciousness is within them, but it has to be awakened. We have to just give them the right kind of engagements which will allow their Krishna consciousness to develop. And they develop a taste for, for hearing and chanting. Now, generally children, they won't be so much inclined towards japa, but kirtan is very good. They can certainly take up kirtan. And we want to encourage them that, that they will do kirtan. They can also offer the arti, do the worship, make the offerings, these kind of things. We want to give them responsibility as early as possible. You want to encourage them to take responsibility to do these kind of things. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Because sometimes when they are told to do something, they are not that focused. They don't like it. And even japa, as you said, is a little difficult to sit for a while for children. So, yeah. Yes, certainly yeah. difficult. That's yeah. why I say you don't want to... If you, you, it's going to be difficult. You don't want to give them too big a challenge. Even for adults, it's difficult to get them to sit for japa. But, you know, young people, uh, your children, you know, if, if they can get much more involved in kirtan, teaching them kirtan. And getting them to do dramas is also something which they very much enjoy. They like to take part in something. It has to be, uh, you have to make a, a, a very interactive mood that they actually feel that they're involved and they're taking part. So this will greatly help them. Thank you, Maharaj. It helps. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Number three. Chapter third. Anthony, you are not audible. Can I, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, it's now. Yeah. So, uh, text number three, uh, chapter third, there is a line that says, religion without philosophy is sentiment or sometimes fanatism, while philosophy without religion is mental speculation. Can you explain the second part of it, that is philosophy without religion is mental speculation with some examples? That is not clear to me. Yes. Okay, philosophy without religion is speculation. Because people have philosophy, they will speak some philosophy, they will speak about the goal of life, what is the purpose of life, who we are, why we're here. Just like Charvaka Muni, he has a philosophy. The goal of life is to eat and to enjoy. Beg, borrow or steal, but eat ghee. So that's Charvaka Muni's philosophy, right? It's an atheistic philosophy. It's a philosophy. There's no religious part to it. But that was his philosophy. And similarly, you have the philosophy of uh, communism. The philosophy of communism it, it came from Karl Marx, and he taught that religion is the opium of the people. They taught that religion is like an opium, like a drug, that people become controlled by religion and they lose their common sense. So this was his philosophy. 
you see, it's speculation. They make their own philosophy without being guided by sadhu, shastra or scripture, sadhu, shastra or guru. So speculation, philosophy without religion is simply speculation. They have a philosophy. There was another, no, there was a French philosopher, uh, was it John Paul Sartre? He taught that simply goal of life is just simply sex, that there's nothing else but sex. And ultimately he died. He, 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 you know, these kind of philosophers, there's so many different nonsense philosophers uh, from in the world, in the Western world especially. You'll see all the nonsense philosophers. And they will teach about materialistic life, to enjoy the senses. They will say the goal of life is satisfy the senses because tomorrow you die. Therefore, enjoy now. So this is their philosophy, but there's no religion there. So it's simply their own speculation. It's coming from the power of their own mind. And so it's imperfect knowledge. Does it make sense? What about the word religion? I'm sorry, Maharaj, your voice is not clear again. Can you in the, more about the word religion. The word religion? Yeah. Well, religion means the teachings of God, to understand something about the nature of the creation. Religion, we talk in, in Krishna consciousness for a religion is Dharma, Sanatan Dharma. That is the eternal religion. And Dharma is it's the inherent nature of every living entity. We give the example that the Dharma of sugar is sweet, the Dharma of chili is hot. Uh, different, yeah. different things each have their, and, and the same way the dharma of the living entity, the dharma of the soul is service. Each and every living entity is engaged in some kind of service, and that service should be dovetailed to the supreme. That is actual dharma, that is religion. Sorry, what? Okay, uh, just want to ask a follow-up question if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, Maharaj, uh, I'm a little confused. Uh, probably my previous understanding on the same subject may not have been accurate from what I've heard today. Uh, what I had understood in the past was when we use the word philosophy, philosophy meant, for example, in our case, Shastra or we can say in simple words, a knowledge base. We have a knowledge base and we have a practice. The practice being the religion. So having the knowledge base and practicing it, having an accurate knowledge base and practicing it, that is religion with a philosophy. But when we talk of uh, religion without philosophy, without philosophy is Sorry, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm coming to uh, When we say philosophy without religion is mental speculation. If we have philosophy means if we have some kind of database, as we say, Ch uh, Charamak, he had a philosophy. But when we say religion in that case, what is the religion of Charamak? Well, I simply said Charvak had a philosophy. I said philosophy without religion is speculation, so I gave the example of Charvak. He's an atheist. He doesn't have religion. So in that case, Maharaj, what, what 
what should he have to make it a religion? What is religion? Religion is that which helps us to understand the Lord, the Supreme, the Godhead. I describe the religion by the word dharma. In our scriptures, in the Vedic scriptures, religion is dharma. A dharma means the occupation and the ultimate occupation, the supreme occupation is that by which we can engage in loving service to the Lord. In Srimad Bhagavatam, it describes like that, Savai pumsam paro dharmo yato bhakti radhoksaje ahai taki apratiyata yayatma suprasidati The supreme occupation for all living entities to attain is loving service to the Supreme Lord. Such service must be unmotivated and uninterrupted to completely satisfy the soul. So that is what we would, you could say religion, it is dharma, it is the occupation of the soul by which we can actually develop our loving relationship with the Supreme Lord. So in that case, what Sorry? No, but will you go ahead? Yeah, Maharaj, so if we go further on to 1866, where we say Sarva Dharman Paritagya. Yes, that, that, uh, that's a different thing. Lord Krishna is speaking, uh, give up all material religion. Give up all material dharmas. There's different kinds of dharmas. There's spiritual dharmas and material dharmas. Lord Krishna is talking about giving up all material dharmas. To take up the ultimate dharma. The ultimate dharma is to surrender to Krishna. That is the ultimate dharma, the highest dharma. The Lord Krishna says, give up all the other dharmas, the material dharmas the other occupations which you have. So when we say mental speculation, we are talking of a philosophy which does not lead us to the Lord. Is that correct interpretation? When we speak of what? Philosophy? In, in, in 3.3, 3 verse number 3.3, it says, while philosophy without religion is mental speculation. Okay, so philosophy should, should without we, religion, yeah? Yeah, is mental speculation. So in simple words, can we say it means that we have a set of books, but they do not lead us to the Lord, and that's why it is being called mental speculation. Is that correct? Yes, you could say like that. Philosophy without religion is speculation, not guided by authority, not guided by Shastra, not guided by saintly persons, simply speculation. Our imperfect judgment, our imperfect mind dictates some knowledge or some philosophy to us. We, we come up to, we, we somehow come to some conclusion by our own mental deliberation. And we think we've understood the nature of the world and the nature of life by our own imperfect judgment. So that is speculation. It doesn't, lead, right, it doesn't lead you anywhere. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. It, it's not going to lead you anywhere. It's imperfect. The, we have to understand the defects of the living entity, that we are conditioned souls. We're conditioned, we make mistakes, we have imperfect senses, we have the tendency to cheat, and we're subject to illusion. These are the four defects of conditioned souls. And because we are conditioned, we cannot come to any perfect knowledge or perfect conclusion. Whatever conclusions, whatever philosophies we may have, in course of time will be defeated by someone else's philosophy by some other judgment. 
in that case, Maharaj, the first part of the statement says, religion without philosophy is a sentiment. So in that case, can we say, religion means, which we were just discussed, is something which takes us to the Lord. If something takes us to the Lord but doesn't have a philosophy, doesn't have books, does it matter? Because we are anyway going to the Lord. So if you have religion without philosophy, it's going to be sentiment. You simply have religion, you have some practice which you're doing, but you don't know why you're doing it. And you don't understand the basis behind it. It's, not, it's going to be sentimental. So it's very important that philosophy should also be there to support the religious practice. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. So you can see in Krishna consciousness that we have both religion and philosophy. It's important for people to actually have also some philosophy. We don't just tell people, oh, just chant Hare Krishna. You don't need to know anything. Just chant Hare Krishna. Certainly if they chant, they'll benefit. But they will benefit more if they understand why they're chanting. And if they chant, they don't know who Krishna is. They don't know anything about the holy name. They'll benefit, but they'll benefit more if they actually understand the philosophy, if they know the, the theology behind the chanting. All right? Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so just to go over what we've been covering here this afternoon, we spoke about the Param Dristva, getting the higher taste in Krishna consciousness, general principles from our experience of Param Dristva, general principles, what general principles should we understand in getting a higher taste? Well, general principles, first of all, we should understand it it depends a lot on, on mercy. If we get some mercy from devotees, you can really, we, can, we can really experience very nicely this Param Drisva. If you are fortunate, if we are fortunate and we get some very good association with senior devotees, then quickly we can, ex we can experience this higher taste. Some people may get that opportunity, even from your own family, you can get that Param Dristva. You have a family, so he could experience the higher taste. He was not attracted to the material world, because taste. All right, so the Param Dristva, then we spoke about Karma Yoga being superior to Karma Sanyas. We heard about the different sages, how they, they're, if they're not properly engaged, if the mind is not properly engaged, it can be carried away. Any one of the senses can carry away the mind, even a man of intelligence. So it's important for us to be properly engaged, to keep the senses engaged in the service of Krishna. So that is karma yoga. But karma sannyas, giving up activities, trying to stop activities. Unless one is really mature, without being very mature, really fixed, then karma sannyas will be very dangerous. Because the nature of the soul is to be active. And we need activities, we need engagement. Okay, then. The relevance of karma yoga being superior to karma sannyas. Arjuna's situation on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. So Arjuna was prepared, he was, he was considering to give up and go and beg. So for Arjuna, it would have been very uh, inappropriate. Because Arjuna is known as a man of honor, he's respected and honored. And now he's going to, he wants to go and live by begging. It would be, it would be very shameful. People would scorn him. What kind of...
person is this? What is Arjuna doing? So Arjuna certainly shouldn't think of karma sannyas and our own practice of Krishna consciousness. We also, unless we're at the final stage of life, you know, maybe later on in our very old age, at the end of life, then you may think of karma sannyas, you know. But even we go to live in the holy place, rather better to go to the holy place to do some service. You take up some simple service, maybe helping. Uh, one devotee who used to live in Vrindavan, for a long time he was cooking, cooking the offerings. But then he got so sick he wasn't able to do the cooking anymore. But he would come to the temple and he would give Charanamrita every day. And people would line up and take Charit, Charanamrita. And with great devotion he would give people Charanamrita and wash their hand. And so like that service, active service is better than trying to give up all activities. A couple of more points about understanding which we hope we have received today. We presented an overview of Krishna's response to Arjuna's question as to the symptoms of a self-realized soul, right? The symptoms of the self-realized soul. And we spoke about particularly how does he speak and how does he sit and how does he walk. So these things are explained there within these verses in the, at the end of the second chapter. The stita pragna, the one who is in perfect knowledge. So he, can restra he restrains his senses, his consciousness is fixed on the Supreme. And then finally the relevance of how a stita dear muni regards happiness and distress. We explained happiness, that we don't deserve the happiness but Krishna is trying to encourage us. We don't really deserve it, Krishna must be just trying to encourage me. And the distress, I deserve to suffer much more, but Krishna has reduced the distress to a minimum. He's just giving me a token distress. So every, we see everything, every situation, the happiness and the distress as the, the mercy of Lord Krishna on us. Like this, this is how the Stita Dear Muni should rega regard happiness and distress. A quote from Srila Prabhupada. Perfection is sure, or is it, what is it, safe? <laughs> so the yogis and other methods, they are trying to control the senses by force. I shall go to the Himalayas. I shall not see any more beautiful women. I shall close down my eyes. These are forceful. You cannot control your senses. There are many instances. You don't require to go to Himalaya. You just remain in Los Angeles city and engage your eyes to see Krishna. You are more than a person who has gone to Himalayas. You'll forget all other thing. This is our process. You don't require to change your position. You engage your ears for hearing Bhagavad Gita as it is. You'll forget all nonsense. You engage your eyes to see the beauty of the deity Krishna. You engage your tongue for tasting Krishna Pasadam. You engage your legs to come to the temple. You engage your hands to work for Krishna. You engage your nose to smell the flowers offered to Krishna. Then where your senses will go. He's captivated all round. The perfection is sure. You don't require to control your senses forcibly don't see, don't do it, don't do it. No, you have to change the engagement. From Bhagavad Gita lecture, second chapter, verses 62 to 72. 
given in Los Angeles, 1968. Are there any questions? Anyone has any more questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. I have a question. So yes. we have an assignment. We have a OBA, a second OBA, to write about Arjuna's dilemma with the personal application. So, so do we need to write all the parts of his uh, dilemma, like compassion, uh, enjoyment, uh, fear of sinful activities, or how? Uh, or it's just one of the things that relates to it in our or somebody known's life, we can... Well, you have to consider what is the required length of your essay, how many yeah. words they want, you know? 600, yes. Okay, so you should be able to explain the different reasons why Arjuna didn't want to fight, yes? The dilemma, Arjuna's dilemma, his problem, yeah, the different reasons Arjuna had. There was actually five prob five reasons, right? Yeah, yeah. Indecision was also there. Mm. Yeah, so you, yes, you write about these things. But sometimes we might not have, uh, in the example that we chose, we might not have all the reasons that Arjuna had. We might have, you know, not such big problems. Like he had big problem of killing the family members, but we might have very small level problems. So. Well, I hope so. I hope you don't have problems like Arjuna. Yeah, I hope you don't have to go to Kurukshetra and fight a war. Yeah, that will be really bad. We really feel sorry. <laughs> no, I, I hope you don't have problems like that. But we do have problems. We do have decisions to make. It's really about making decisions, right? Arjuna has to make a decision. Are you hearing me okay? Oh. Yes, Maharaj, I can hear you. Are you you're okay? I, I saw the... Yeah, sorry, the, I was disconnected, Maharaj. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The yeah. connection is unstable. But I think that the point is, Arjuna's dilemma is he has to make a decision. And making decisions is what we're, that, what, how we have to understand the situation. You know, we have to make decisions. What are you going to do? Are you going to get married or are you not going to marry, you know? And like this, you know, are you going to go to work or are you not going to go to work? Are you going to take this job or are you not going to take this job? You, you always have to make decisions all the time, you know? Are you going to eat supper in the evenings or not? We're just going to eat two, two meals a day? <laughs> you know, you have to, we have to make decisions all the time. So Arjuna also, he had to make a decision. And, how did he solve his, his problem? He surrendered to Krishna. It was Krishna who solved his problems, right? And so you, we also have to make decisions. We have to take shelter of a spiritual authority and be guided by them. We have to be submissive to the spiritual teacher. So we, okay. when Arjuna, Arjuna became confused about his duty, so we often become confused. We don't know what should be, should I do this? I don't know, I'm confused. <laughs> Somebody got the Nobel Prize, I think it was a couple of years ago. It was about making decisions. <laughs> I thought it was really interesting. I just had to read the Bhagavad Gita, you know. But his whole theory, his, he gave up, the, the man who got the Nobel Prize, he, he wrote a whole, he had a whole thesis about making decisions. So this is what it's all about, really, Arjuna's dilemma. Should he fight or not? No, we have, are you going to work or are you not going to work? <laughs> you have to make decisions every day. Are you going to eat or are you not going to eat? Are you going to sleep or not going to sleep? Every moment we have to make decisions, so we have to be properly guided. Is it, is it, does it help you, Maharaji? Yes, yes, that helps very much. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so we'll see you tomorrow. We'll be back tomorrow, 3 o'clock. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki. Yes. Go back to the Thank you, Maharaj. 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 Thank you, Maharaj.